Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our spring webinar series, um, which is hosted by the UKCCSRC. Uh, my name is Gan Wang. I'm a research fellow at uh, Harvard University. Uh, I'm working on CCS and hydrogen storage. So today, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, two uh, excellent ECR speakers who will share uh, the uh, latest progress of their work uh, on CCS. So we changed the order. So the first order now, would, the first speaker would be uh, Miss Catherine Harris. So she is a second year PhD student in the uh, subsurface CO2 research group, uh, uh, part of the earth science and engineering department at Imperial College London. So her research encompasses the mathematical analysis, uh, numerical flow simulations, and a laboratory X-ray CT cold flood experiments. So her work is to improve the uh, understanding of the impact and heterogeneity on the uh, carbon trapping of carbon dioxide in the subsurface. So the second speaker is uh, Dr. Damon Clary. So he is the senior research associate in the Tindall Center at the University of East Anglia. So he is part of the uh, FABGGR team working on a stakeholder workshop and policy briefing note outputs. So he completed his PhD at the uh, University of Leeds in 2019, uh, where he worked on the impact of biomass combustion on amine solvents in BECCS power plants. So uh, just as uh, Rachel mentioned, so uh, each presentation is about 20 minutes long and followed by a Q&A session. So you are more than welcome to uh, leave your comments and questions in the uh, uh, either, either message box or you can ask uh, later. So our speakers will address them at the Q&A session. So now, uh, Ms. Catherine Harris, the stage is yours. Thank you. I'll try to share my screen. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, as Gang said, my name is Catherine, um, and I'm a second year PhD student at Imperial College. Uh, and today I wanted to talk to you about uh, my research project where I'm studying the impacts of heterogeneity on CO2 capillary trapping within the Captain Sandstone. So I'm going to be quantifying capillary heterogeneity trapping and discussing the implications from upscaling from core to field scale. So I'm looking at the framework of geological carbon storage within saline aquifers, I'm studying the trapping stage of a CO2 injection and migration project. So I'm going to be looking specifically at the immobition processes that occur at the trailing edge of the CO2 plume. So I'm sure you're all familiar with why we need CCS. Climate change is a huge challenge faced by our generation and fossil fuels are predicted to dominate our primary energy supply till the mid-century. However, as outlined by the Paris Agreement in 2015, it's necessary that we limit warming to less than two degrees C in order to avoid the most dangerous consequences of climate change. So in order to meet these stabilization goals, emissions reductions of 50 to 80% are needed by 2050 to be net to reach net zero by the end of the century. Um, so I think the word net is really important as it has allows us to incorporate negative emissions technologies and other um, negative emissions technologies into fossil fuel energy production and other um, sources difficult to decarbonize. And this will help us to meet the demands of the coming century. So CCS is expected to contribute to 20% of necessary re emissions reductions, reducing overall emission mitigation costs by 30%. So as this graph shows at the bottom of the screen, cumulatively by the end of the century, we need to store between 600 and 2000 gigatons of CO2 in deep geological formations to meet climate targets. And so what this means is, is that by 2050, we need to be storing volumes similar to the current scale of the oil and gas industry today. So this is a technology we need to start implementing and scaling up now. So if CCS technologies are predicted to play an important role in our transition to net zero, we need to be able to understand them in more detail. So geological carbon storage relies on physical and chemical trapping mechanisms to ensure CO2 is securely stored. So it's vital we understand and can effectively model these mechanisms. So the goal is to stop the CO2 from leaking. And this is done effectively by converting from a buoyant unstable phase to a stable trap phase. Looking at the figure on the top right of the screen, this, this is describing the trapping stages post injection and the contribution of different trapping mechanisms over time. So initially we're very reliant on the cap rock, a shaler and mud rock for a sealing capacity. But then after 10, hundreds or thousands of years, we expect CO2 to form more stable forms. So residual trapping 
um, or capillary trapping occurs due to capillary forces and is controlled by snap-up processes. So capillary trapping is a key mechanism underpinning storage security and immobilizing a significant proportion of the CO2 plume. However, there's uncertainty associated with this trapping, which results from geological heterogeneities. And that's what I want to discuss today. Um, so just to finish talking about these figures on the slides, then over further time, you can see from the figure in the top right, we have dissolution and then eventually mineralization. Um, and we sometimes, uh, this mineralization is more commonly associated with the highly reactive basalts in Iceland, where you see this process very quickly. Um, and then in the figure on the bottom left, um, I've included this diagram as it shows some of the key multi-phase flow properties that affect flow. Um, so constitutive relationships such as relative permeability on the left, then capillary pressure and initial residual trapping um, characteristics. As I said, there's a significant uncertainty which remains for CO2 sequestration and that is the effect of natural geological heterogeneity. And this is intrinsic to sedimentary rocks in which carbon sequestration occurs. So these heterogeneities are expected to impact fluid migration and trapping over different length scales. And this in introduces uncertainty into our current models. So what I'm interested in is studying the impact of capillary pressure heterogeneity and how capillary pressure at the small scale affects fluid migration and trapping. So how, how to understand this impact of ge geology and heterogeneity, what we do in the lab is we start at the small scale um, to understand how stuff works at the much, much larger scale. Um, so in a carbon sequestration project, CO2 is injected and forms a plume and it migrates through the aquifer under the influence of different forces, so gravity, viscous and capillary forces. And this gives rise to brine imbibition into the pore space at the trailing edge of the CO2 plume. So probably a lot of us are familiar with pore scale residual trapping, and this occurs due to capillary forces and is controlled by snap-off processes. However, at the larger scale, capillary pressure heterogeneity modifies the distribution of CO2 trapped. CO2 saturation increases behind regions of high capillary entry pressure, trapping CO2 at saturations greater than pore scale residual trapping alone. And this is consequence of capillary pressure and flux continuity within the system. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, I've shown a simple two region model. So a low capillary entry pressure region overlaid by a high capillary entry pressure region. And I'm flowing upwards into this 1D domain. Um, and then what the figure shows is that on imbibition, uh, we observe a CO2 saturation that builds up behind the region of high capillary entry pressure, greater than pore scale residual trapping alone. And so throughout this presentation, this, this additional mechanism, this additional buildup of CO2, which I refer to as capillary heterogeneity trapping. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the potential importance of capillary heterogeneity trapping demonstrated within a target field scale storage site. So the case study I'm looking at is the Captain D sandstone, and this is from the Golden Eye field located in the North Sea. It's a poorly consolidated sandstone with thin mudstone layers. Um, so the Captain sandstone was a target storage site for the discontinued Peters Head CCS project as part of the UK's 2012 commercialization program. However, this continues to act as a site of interest for future UK CCS projects. Um, and that's why I've chosen to study it for this piece of work. So to demonstrate the potential impact of this mechanism within a potential UK storage site, I've created 1D field scale models of the Captain Sandstone based off site-specific experimental data. So this slide demonstrates the workflow I followed. I used core, field, core scale data and field scale data to build um, heterogeneous fine scale, fine scale models in 1D. And then I ran flow simulations on these models and used the results to inform why we might observe scatter in core flood experiments. And then this gives us information on the best way to upscale from core data. Um, so this is done by evaluating the potential implications of extracting particular trapping characteristics from core flood experimental data. So to start with, I'll discuss the core scale experimental data used in the models. So much of this data is based off a 2020 paper by work carried out by colleagues at Imperial College London, detailing porosity, permeability, capillary pressure and relative permeability data for plugs spanning the 65 metre interval of interest of the Captain Sandstone, calculated through core flooding experiments. 
On the left hand side here, I'm demonstrating the Brooks Corey capillary pressure function for drainage. Um, so the results from the experiments collapse into a single Brooks Corey function with the best fit modeled as I've shown. And then on the right hand side, I've demonstrated Corey parameterization of gas and water relative permeability curves measured on one composite core during drainage. I've also shown the gas imhibition relative permeability curve, and this is calculated based on the mobile CO2 saturation, where I've just calculated the mobile CO2 um, based off standards methods by accounting for the CO2 that is residually trapped. So this is the plug scale initial residual saturation relationship. So we carried out steady state core flooding experiments using medical X-ray CT imaging where at the end of drainage, the core is flooded with 100% brine, and then the initial and residual saturations are measured. And this provides detailed characterization of continuum multiplace flow properties. So here I'm showing the residual trapping characteristics over the centimeter scale. So we see that the pore scale residually trapped saturation has a first order dependence on the initial saturation achieved prior to brine inhibition. And, and although there's many models available to parameterize this relationship, we found here that the data fits well with a land trapping model, where the land trapping coefficient C acts as a proportionality constant. So as you can see from the figure, as C increases, the residual trap saturation decreases. So by fitting these models to the data, we find that the average land trapping parameter C is 1.7. However, this varies between 0.8 and 2.8, representing a very large variation in locally trapped CO2. And this tells us that the quantity and distribution of capillary trapping is sensitive to the length scale and connectivity of capillary heterogeneities. So along with this core scale experimental data, I also used field scale data to build my models. So due to its potential as a target UK storage site, there's lots of public available information online regarding the Captain Sandstone. So to create these one day field scale models, I used porosity variations over a depth of 65 meters, 65 meters derived from shell neutron wireline log data. And then in addition, um, the porosity permeability relationship can be found um, based off ARCAL measurements made at in-situ conditions. So this is the field scale data that I used in my models. I combine this core scale experimental data and field scale experimental data to make 1D geological models of the Captain Sandstone. So leverage J scaling is used to scale the capillary entry pressure with depth over the full 65 meter interval. And this is done for CO2 and brine parameters. So based on the experimental data, vertically heterogeneous 1D models have been developed where here I've assumed porosity to be constant over one meter intervals representative of bedding planes with heterogeneity length one meter, as shown in the figure on the right. Um, and it's so this variation in capillary entry pressure with depth that eventually will result in capillary heterogeneity trapping. So I then ran numerical simulations on these 1D models um, using commercial simulator CMG IMAX. So the following simulations incorporate viscous, capillary, and gravity effects. Um, so this model represents a 1D vertical column through the aquifer with flow upwards perpendicular to the heterogeneities. So to model CO2 sequestration and subsequent trapping, CO2 is injected at a constant rate on the order of centimeters per day into the bottom of the domain for two pore volumes. And then I produce fluid at the top to ensure a voidage replacement. On the figure, uh, the graph on the right hand side, the um, is showing the saturation profile at the end of drainage. Um, the saturation profile is seen to be heterogeneous, but this is due to capillary entry pressure variations within the system. These results at the end of drainage are stored and form the initial saturation for the start of the imhibition process. So brine is injected into the bottom of the domain for two poor volumes at this for two pore volumes at the same rate that CO2 was previously injected. And this mimics brine imhibition. Um, so when we carry out this imhibition process, on poor scale residual trapping alone, we would expect to see a residual saturation 
which is related to the initial saturation through the land trapping model. However, when we carried out these simulations, what we observed was that the final saturations are greater than what we would expect from poor scale residual trapping alone. And this is due to the impact of capillary heterogeneity trapping. And this results from capillary pressure continuity conditions within the system. So we can then use the results of these simulations to quantify the impact of capillary heterogeneities on trapping. So this is the equation I use to sort of quantify the proportion of heterogeneities, which is um, result from uh, the proportion of trapping. Sorry, this is the equation I use to quantify the proportion of trapping, which results from capillary heterogeneities. Um, and as you can see from these initial results shown, the proportion of capillary heterogeneity trapping within the system is a function of rate. So for the rates used, we observe that capillary heterogeneity trapping accounts for 1% and 7% of total trapping respectively at these rates. Then we can use these initial results to inform back on um, full scale experimental data. So we're gonna look at the implications of extracting particular trapping characteristics from core flood experimental data. Um, so what I've shown here is an initial residual saturation plot, and this is just a, an alternative way to consider the saturation profiles we previously saw for the Captain Sandstone. So the poor scale residually trapped saturations are related to the initial saturations by the land trapping model as we input into the simulations. However, we can see that heterogeneity acts to break down this relationship, and deviations from the land trapping model result from capillary heterogeneity trapping. So this may be used to explain the scatter observed in IR cool flood experiments and deviations from poor scale trapping models. Um, so I'm showing here the impact of rate. So we can see here that clearly capillary heterogeneity trapping is a function of rate. And this indicates that the average land trapping parameter is also a function of rate. And therefore experimental conditions need to be representative of reservoir conditions. This has implications for the choice of trapping parameter that we extract from experimental data. The average trapping parameter commonly extracted incorporates the impact of capillary heterogeneity trapping and no longer describes the poor scale residual trapping mechanism alone. So this average trapping parameter acts as a sort of upscaled um, or effective trapping parameter incorporating capillary heterogeneity below the experimental REV. This is the um, core scale experimental data from earlier. So previously I used the average land trapping parameter 1.7. So now I'm gonna test the impact of using the maximum land trapping parameter 2.8, which doesn't include the impact of capillary heterogeneity trapping. I ran simulations using both CS 1.7 and CS 2.8, where these are the experimental average and maximum trapping parameters respectively. Um, and the results show that extracting either the average or maximum trapping parameter from experimental data has important consequences on field scale simulations. So I'm now gonna overlay the results of the field scale simulations with core scale experimental data. And it's observed that modeling the field scale Captain Sanson system with the maximum experimental land trapping parameter 2.8 as shown on the right hand side results in a much better overlap with core plug experimental data. And this suggests that extracting the maximum trapping parameter rather than the average, which is typically used, may be more appropriate for use in numerical simulators, such as CMG Amex, which capture the impact of heterogeneities on top of poor scale residual trapping. So I then apply this workflow to the system using the maximum experimental land trapping parameter 2.8, and we get the following results. So we find that modeling the system with the maximum experimental land trapping parameter, we found that capillary heterogeneity trapping may account for a larger proportion of trapping in the system than originally assumed when we used the average experimental land trapping parameter. So we can see from these results that capillary heterogeneity trapping accounts for approximately double the proportion of trapping when the maximum land trapping parameter is used compared to with the average. And so what this shows us is that the impact of the capillary heterogeneity trapping mechanism might be greater than we or originally assumed. 
So just to conclude quickly, um, I ran flow simulations of heterogeneous field scale Captain Sandstone models to quantify the proportion of capillary heterogeneity trapping. I then demonstrated deviations from traditional poor scale trapping models, consequence of capillary heterogeneity trapping. And I've shown that the results from the field scale models can be linked back to the core scale data, helping to inform us on best working practices for core data analysis. So the main takeaway from these initial results so far is that when we model the system with the maximum experimental land trapping parameter, we found that the proportion of trapping caused by capillary heterogeneity is approximately doubles compared with using the experimental average land trapping parameter. Um, so some further work carrying on from this is to experimentally evaluate the impact of system conditions on IR trapping relationships, which is hopefully something I'm going to start doing tomorrow in the lab, um, to develop methods to upscale the impact of capillary heterogeneity trapping and extend to higher dimensions. So these simulations are currently in 1D and I next want to study them in two and three dimensions to try to understand capillary heterogeneity trapping in a more realistic reservoir system. I just want to thank you for listening. Um, I've left my email on the slide if you want to get in contact with me later, but I look forward to your questions. Thank you. All right, so uh, very from the uh, informative presentation. Uh, great work, Kentrin. So uh, we have a question from Jillian, uh, Jillian Pickup. So he said, uh, she said, I have a question about the effects of heterogeneities which are not laterally, uh, laterally continuous. Um, yeah, so currently in the thought stage rather than the result stage, but this is, I suppose, if you think of a 2D system, because in 1D would, you're just looking at the vertical direction. So as soon as you consider like a two-dimensional system, you can have, um, as you say, heterogeneities which aren't continually uh, constant across the domain um, and that's obviously going to have an impact because you're like able to have flow going around the heterogeneities um, so this is just supposed to model when you see like a large lateral um, sort of like continuous layer sort of like a bedding layer within the system that's sort of what I've tried to model so far but yeah definitely that's currently in the initial modeling stages of trying to come up with different ways that we might not have entirely laterally continuous systems um, I have one question, Katrin. So you mentioned about the heterogeneity and also the much higher uh, residual gas saturation. I mean, are there any correlations of the level of the heterogeneity with the, um, let's say, the, the, the proportion of the much uh, uh, increased residual, residual gas saturation? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So it's the capillary entry pressure differences between the layers. So if you have sort of like some sands that are very similar, then you'd see less capillary heterogeneity trapping than if you had like a sand and a very impermeable uh, sort of like mudstone or something, then you see much more, much more trapping. That's definitely a function of how much you expect to see this critical saturation build up. Okay, we have another question uh, from John Gibbons. So he, uh, you mentioned about the water production. So how important is this and how does water production rate affect the results? Um, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. Um, so what we do is we first like drain the system. So we inject CO2 and then we produce the water that's already in the aquifer from the top to sort of like ensure avoided replacement. Um, and then we would inject water or brine, um, I should say, into the aquifer to sort of model brine inhibition. And so the rate in which you inject this, so the rate of brine inhibition is what we observe in these results is really important. So that sort of impacts how much capillary heterogeneity trapping we would see. And you can sort of think of that as if we have like capillary forces um, working sort of like capillary forces trying to keep it in place with, with viscous forces trying to like push it up so you can sort of think of them competing so as you sort of increase the rate and increase the viscous force you'd expect to see this capillary dominated this capillary effect sort of like decrease so water inhibition rate is really important i hope that answers the question does it john yeah i think so uh, that's, uh... I, well, I guess I guess I just say. I mean, in, in practice, can you can you vary water production rate that much? I mean, is that is that a real 
so, more control over. Yes, it's quite difficult to vary itself. Um, obviously, you can only really vary the, the in rate you're injecting CO2. Um, but what I try to show sort of like through this is that we don't know it. So that's like an uncertainty in how much capillary heterogeneity trapping you would expect to see. But also you'd expect to see maybe different rates at different parts of the reservoir. So you might expect to see more capillary trapping sort of like maybe further away from the well where there's lower viscous forces. Um, so just to sort of like give an idea of how much we would expect to see at different parts of the reservoir, but it's very, not very well constrained and is a big source of uncertainty within the models. So then the next question, I mean, were you talking about engineered water production or, or sort of effectively just natural water movements in the reservoir? So I'm, I'm thinking at the moment just natural, but potentially injected. So at the moment, just sort of trying to look at so in the simulation you have to inject the water to sort of you could also have it just as like a gravity um just to have it as gravity but if you want it like coming in at some rate say the background hydrodynamic of the reservoir or just at the same rate as say you expect the co2 to move through you could then expect that potentially the water would come back naturally at like the similar rate to the, what the co2 is moving through and so those were what i sort of like bounded my rates by sort of like a maximum rate as what the CO2 plume is injected and a minimum rate as sort of like the background hydrodynamic of the reservoir. Yeah, I see, thanks. I think we can still take one last question. So the question from uh, Rob Knapp. So are there plans to add structural discontinuities such as the falls into the modeling? Um, yeah, I think potentially. So at the moment, this is just looking at sort of like um, systems, very simple systems, but I plan to go on to sort of model this and we just started a project to try to model the endurance field much more realistically. So potentially to include there. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so I think that's enough for, for everybody. And now we have the second speaker, uh, which is Dr. Uh, Clary. So uh, are you ready? I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you very much, gang, and sorry for the... Um, initial kind of interruption from Wi-Fi. Um, could you just confirm that you can see my screen okay? Yeah, looks great. Yeah, not a problem, yeah. yep. Thank you very much. Um, cool, yeah, so today I'm gonna to be uh, talking about an expert assessment of greenhouse gas removal options. Um, this is based on some work um, done within the Tyndall Center at UEA and um, with a stakeholder group assessing greenhouse gas removal options uh, a paper that's recently been submitted uh, just before Christmas to Global Environmental Change. Um, it's still under review at the moment, but hopefully we'll hear back from that soon. And it's part of the FAB GGR project, um, which is a consortium of universities, um, which you can see at the bottom there. And it's a NERC funded project. Um, you can see the kind of co-authors um, also there on the first page, but I'll just give a little overview to the FAB GGR project. Um, so FAB GGR stands for feasibility of afforestation and BECs for greenhouse gas removal. And what we're really looking to do is assess the real world feasibility and consequences of large scale afforestation and BECs. Um, the PI of the project is Naomi Vaughan, that's my boss at UEA. Um, and as I said before, it's a very interdisciplinary project. Um, lots of work packages looking at earth system modeling, crop modeling, ecosystem service modeling, LCA, and um, some service, uh, some social and governance issues. Um, I'm working on work package one, which is the kind of stakeholder engagement um, elements, which I'll be talking about today. Um, within that, we're working on some policy briefing notes from the project that will be pulling together all of these different results from the different work packages and presenting those in a accessible and um, understandable way. So they'll be coming out in the next few months. Yeah, so the stakeholder engagements, that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. We've had two workshops within the project. Um, the first one has been published, which you can see there with the link at the top. And what that was doing is um, looking at our first engagement with our group of experts and stakeholders um, within greenhouse gas removal. to identify what are the main issues for greenhouse gas removal um, within the UK or within a, a UK expert context. And then marrying that up with um, integrated assessment models, um, what they 
currently kind of capture in terms of the main issues or what's modeled within those. Um, there are some things that can't be modeled, things such as political will. So we've recently um, seen Joe Biden come in as US president. He has a much um, more positive approach towards decarbonization, which will probably have a, an impact on the rollout of technologies such as these. Um, but that sort of thing compared to, compared to Trump can't really be modeled um, within future emission models. So what we suggest as part of that is that um, having a discussion around um, all sorts of things that can't necessarily be modeled um, is important for assessing the fe feasibility of the rollout of these technologies. <clears throat> so the second stakeholder workshop, um, which I ran back in November 2019, was a, a one day workshop. Um, 22 participants, 12 of those were returners from the first workshop um, or very similar kind of replacements from the same organization. The makeup of, of those participants was about 50% business in, and industry, 25% uh, NGO and 25% policy. Uh, we had two morning sessions of about an hour each and one afternoon session. And we used the stakeholder workshop as an opportunity to um, present the interim results from all different work packages. And we're very keen to kind of get the feedback from our experts um, to feed into those different work packages um, to make sure that we were thinking about um, or aware of all the issues that people um, brought forward and thought were relevant for the different work, pack work packages. Um, they also informed the work that I'm gonna talk about today. So, as part of the, um, this engagement process in the second stakeholder workshop, we used a, a multi-criteria mapping approach um, to ask our experts to assess four different supply chains that were developed with our uh, stakeholder group in the first workshop and they were refined um, as part of that process. So what we were asking them to do is to come up with a, set, a list of criteria that they thought were important for assessing greenhouse gas removal um, within this context. Um, so generally people came up with a list of about five to 15 sort of criteria that they thought were imp important for greenhouse gas removal. Um, they weren't really restricted in what they could come up with in terms of those criteria. We did provide the issues that had come out of the first workshop as something that could aid them in, um, in the process, but some people chose to use that and some people didn't. Um, we didn't really want to restrict what people um, thought, were important, thought were important in terms of criteria. So they came up with their own list and then we asked them to score the uh, four supply chains that I'm about to introduce um, against their individual criteria. So that was the first step which happened um, in interviews prior to the workshop. Then we had um, two relevant um, breakout sessions at the workshop. Um, the first session um, we asked, we presented participants with their results from our multi-criteria mapping interviews and um, asked them to compare their results within their groups. And um, the aim of this was to try and pick out any points of consensus around why particular supply chains have scored well and, or other supply chains might have not scored so well or um, essentially the reasons behind them, was, was there any consensus behind them or any points that were up, up for contention um, within our expert group. Um, because we had a good few people, there were obviously gonna be differences in opinion. So we wanted to identify what those differences in opinion were. And then as a second breakout group, we um, went through a scaling up exercise where first we asked our experts to pick out the pinch points in um, our supply chains. So to identify the main kind of problem areas that they could see within those supply chains. Um, then we took things to a UK scale. So we were asking them to think of if these supply chains were scaled up to the amounts um, required to hit UK climate targets for GGR, um, what were gonna be the issues with that scale up and then taking it again to the global scale of the amount of GGR that might be needed um, within, within a global context for climate change. Um, what are the, then gonna be the the new issues that arise. So that was the overview of how we engaged with our experts. These are the four supply chains um, 
as I said before, we, we kind of referred back to our stakeholder group in the first workshop to kind of refine these. And um, then we wanted to get to a point where we could use these four supply chains consistently throughout the FabGGR project so that we could run a, an LCA analysis and um, keep a bit of consistency throughout the project with regard to using the same supply chains. So these are the supply chains that we asked our um, experts to assess. There are three BEX supply chains, um, bioenergy bio and carbon capture and storage, and one a forestation, one at the bottom. So the first supply chain is based on um, residues generated in North America, which are then shipped over to the UK and combusted in a large scale combustion facility um, of about four gigawatts with a post combustion CCS um, step on the end. The second one is a smaller scale BEX option um, using uh, combined heat and power of around uh, 100 megawatts with a different feedstock of Miscanthus, which was grown in the UK then baled and transported to the facility by road. Um, but again, with a post combustion CCS step on the end um, with storage in the North Sea. The third supply chain is looking at the production of hydrogen. Uh, again, a different feedstock. So short rotation coppice this time, again, grown in the UK, um, which is harvested and processed into pellets, transported by road again, and um, gasified to produce hydrogen with a pre-combustion CCS step. And then the fourth supply chain is a quite simple afforestation supply chain where we're taking unforested, currently unforested land in the UK, uh, low quality land such as pasture, um, going through a conversion process um, to essentially plant trees in the ground and maintain that as a forest with um, some bioenergy coming off of that forest. So this is the overall results of all of the interviews um, that were taking place prior to the workshop. So what this graph shows is essentially um, a score of zero to 100, which is an arbitrary scale, um, which we asked our experts to, to score each of the supply chains on. And as I said before, we were asking each of our um, experts to assess the supply chains against the criteria that they'd come up with. Um, so essentially, this is a measure of how well the criteria or the supply chains meet their own set of criteria. So it is an amalgamation of lots of different criteria and, um, and lots of different scores. So about that's tw 22 um, results altogether. The box on the plot, um, it is a box because we asked each of our participants to score with a pessimistic and an optimistic score on each criteria and each supply chain. Um, so the bottom of the box is essentially the um, average of the uh, scores for, for the supply chain and the top is the average of the um, pessimistic scores, no, the optimistic scores for the supply chain. Uh, the whisker is essentially just the lowest score given for that supply chain and the highest score given for that supply chain on any criteria. So we can see from this that afforestation is um, performing higher on this uh, most criteria assessment than the BEX supply chains. Um, I've given on the right kind of reasons why or criteria that each supply chain each supply chain scored well on. So we can see for afforestation, um, it scored well in business model and incentives and financial sustainability. That is essentially because people saw afforestation as cheap um, and could be yeah, rolled out in a in a cheap way. It scored well in for environmental sustainability and social acceptability. Um, again, people didn't really question too much that it was environmentally sustainable and um, socially acceptable. The issues that afforestation didn't perform quite as well on is temporal scale and land, availab land availability and suitability. Um, that's essentially because it, to plant a forest, it takes up generally a lot of space um, and it will take quite a long time to be storing um, your carbon and removing it from the atmosphere. Interestingly, that's where the first supply chain, power of the residues, actually scored very well, um, or at least better than uh, the other supply chains. Um, essentially, it takes up less space and um, has the potential to remove carbon dioxide quicker from the atmosphere. And the it was 
um, stated that the technology readiness of that supply chain um, was good and potentially ready to be rolled out quickly. The downfall of that first supply chain is kind of the incentives and financial sustainability and also some questions raised around um, environmental sustainability. Um, what's interesting is that where the first supply chain didn't score so well is exactly where the third supply chain did score well. Hydrogen with short rotation coppice um, scored well for incentives and financial sustainability and also environmental sustainability. However, the technology readiness um, was a, and temporal scale was a bit of a, a downside for that supply chain. Um, the combined heat and power supply chain with Miscanthus didn't score quite as well as, um, as supply chain one and three, um, potentially due to the scale of this, it was a 100 megawatt plant. So it's much smaller scale supply chain looking to try and look at the kind of um, more local aspects of BEX that could be rolled out. And, um, but it didn't perform quite as well. It did perform well in terms of incentives and financial sustainability. That was because um, the heat element of this supply chain um, was seen as an option for further income um, rather than just electricity and potentially some um, incentives. So overall, from our interviews, there was a lot of criteria generated, um, 253. So this is myself and my co-authors attempt to kind of simplify all of those criteria again in a, a usable and um, informative way. Um, we grouped them into to top groups and subgroups. And um, what we see here in, in the numbers is essentially how many um, times each of the subgroups was mentioned. So we can see that land availability and suitability is highly mentioned, business model is also highly mentioned and social acceptability. Um, we generally try to, for each criteria, code it under just one of these um, subgroups. Some of the criteria that were generated, it wasn't possible to just slot it under one. Um, so we started to see some linkages between the different groups. So that's what we can see with these dotted lines here. Um, so we can see some links between land, avail land availability and suitability, um, social acceptance, because people have opinions on how they think land should be used, and also some links to kind of land use, rights and ownership, who owns the land, um, is it being farmed at the moment, um, will they want to swap over to using bioenergy rather than the farming practices that they're currently using? And um, we can see at the bottom there, policy effectiveness is seen as um, linking to that as very important for um, if we want to change the use of land in the UK or otherwise. Um, also linked to that is business model um, and incentives and financial sustainability. Generally, if um, we want investors in these sorts of technologies um, to be investing, they need to see where their return on investment is, is coming back to them um, for the long term. So that was kind of identi identified as a bit of a problem or a, a challenge for government incentives or however financial models are going to be set up. They need to be convincing to investors that they will be getting a long term return on investment. Um, which can be tricky, um, especially with changes in government and changes in agenda. Location is another thing. Uh, we didn't really specify the location of these um, supply chains deliberately. Um, we didn't want to pick any favorites or, or anything like that, but it was identified that there, to, to decide that, you need to make sure that there's infrastructure for biomass in place, infrastructure for CCS, and also the kind of energy systems and integration um, part of um, each supply chain. Moving on to the scaling um, assessment that was done as part of this work. So firstly, we were looking at the exact points upon, along the supply chain. So we asked our experts to kind of specify what point in the supply chain they could foresee issues. Um, so that's what you can see here on the y-axis, the different steps of the supply chains, generally kind of across the board um, for the, this is only for the BEX supply chain. So what we can see here is um, the number of comments for the different steps of the supply chains are mostly focused around the early part of the supply chain. So the biomass production, 
and the latest parts of the supply chain, so your energy conversion and your and your CCS. We don't really see too many mentions of any problems with the kind of harvesting of biomass, processing of it, and, and transport. In terms of biomass production, again, the main um, issue is kind of land avail availability. Um, yeah, land availability, and are you going to have that biomass available? That was also um, a potential problem um, seen at the energy conversion step. Um, also, the energy conversion. So, your business models are they going to be in place for your energy conversion, and is the technology um, going to be scalable? And for CCS, uh, particular interest. Um, to this group. There's questions around the availability of CCS. Is it going to be there? Is it going to be incentivized? And also the um, social acceptance um, yet to be confirmed for CCS as it's rolled out and potentially it might be um, important how it's rolled out. Um, we've seen cases of how things are rolled out with regards to wind turbines and uh, fracking that really impact its, its acceptance socially. So we then went from the um, supply chain scale to asking our experts to assess what was seen um, as a major problem or potential problem for the UK scale rollout. So again, essentially to meet um, UK climate targets for greenhouse gas removal. And again, this issue of um, willingness of landowners to convert their land um, or, or who owns the land and do they want to convert their land um, identified as a, a key pinch point. Um, nursery capacity, so is there going to be the seeds available to plant bioenergy crops or trees? And again, are the policy and incentives going to be in place? At the global scale, so again, thinking the, how much um, GGR is needed globally to tackle climate change, we see more of uh, issues around global cooperation. So as these supply chains are rolled out on a, you know, ac across the world, and incorporate more nations, um, that becomes more of an issue of um, nations cooperating. So if we're currently importing biomass from um, North America and they decide they want to do something different with um, their biomass, then that's a potential issue for us as a, a BEX plant. Um, and regulation, lots of different nations have their, their own um, regulation systems in place. Um, this can be particularly an issue for biomass sustainability. If we're importing biomass again from another nation, um, they might have different regulations or different standards um, for biomass sustainability than we do. So what's gonna happen there? How do we get to a point that works for everyone and avoid um, double counting of CO2 removal as well? So just to conclude, um, this work pulls out the main criteria that our expert stakeholder group deems important for um, considerations of large-scale BEX and deforestation. Biomass, land and CCS availability are consistently um, picked out as some of the main criteria mentioned throughout the engagements. Business models and business models and social acceptability are also very well covered. Um, again, just a, it did seem to come through a good bit throughout during the, during the engagement that farming community might be um, a potential issue that um, needs to be carefully monitored and um, carefully imp implemented. And that kind of ties in with the policy development and incentives required, um, trying to deliver, deliver multiple objectives where possible. Um, that's an, that can fit in with the farming community. If there's possibilities to um, tackle climate change and also improve biodiversity, both of which are going through crisis at the moment, um, it's important to try and um, generate policies that are gonna work for both of those and there's opportunities to create jobs and uh, within um, the energy sector that, that, that are also going to work and at the global scale global cooperation as I just said is, um, is a main finding from things that could really impact the rollout of these technologies. Um, finding from the previous workshop um, we recommend a responsible assessment approach um, which relies upon not just IAMS models, but also complementary methods, um, having a discussion around what are the other things outside of IAMS that can affect the, feas the feasibility of these um, technologies as they're rolled out. Um, yes, I think that's everything. Thank you very much. There's my email and again, the project uh, web website and the two papers if um, 
if you'd like to note them down. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. Um, so I can see we have already some questions coming in and feel free to unmute and unmute yourself when I read a question and if you wish to have further discussion with the speaker. So a question from Felix, um, have you looked at into the uh, biocore production and utilization as alternative to the CCS process? And what is your assessment of that? Sorry, what was the, uh, the process? Uh, so alternative, alternative to the CCS process? I'm just trying to find it. Oh, what's that? Well, utilization. No, we haven't um, looked at anything. We, we kind of, for us, it was looking at BEX. Um, there were so many options that we could have looked at in terms of um, different supply chains in terms of, of BEX. We, we really tried to um, narrow down to just for supply chain so that we could get a useful assessment out of that. But no, we haven't looked at um, biochar or any, any utilization options. Okay, there, there's one question from Neil. So how much support from BECCS will be given via ELMS? That's a good question. So I think that's ELMS, um, which is the environmental land management um, policy that's being developed uh, within government at the moment. Um, so it's trying to, uh, come up with a cross-governmental um, policy that encourages things like BECs and also um, essentially does what I was trying to suggest that we have a consideration for um, biodiversity, farming options, um, these sorts of things. But I definitely don't know how much exact support is going to be given to BECs. I think that's a, a good question um, and very much a, a good question of how it's going to be incentivized as, as we go forward. I think it's a, quite an interesting um, debate at the moment. Uh, all right, so there's another question from Jude Asibor. Uh, so is there any possibility of future consideration for other GGR options like DACCS as well as enhanced weathering? Mm. Um, I think there is, DAC is, um, another much talked about GGR option, um, at, you know, that's talked about at the moment. We didn't include that as part of, of this project um, just because it's not really currently modeled in um, kind of future emission scenarios. So we want to stick with the, the ones that are most heavily relied upon in um, integrated assessment models at the moment, which are BEX and uh, afforestation. There is very much scope for, for DAC to kind of um, come in and feature within that scope as definitely um, could happen. Enhanced weathering is also talked about as, as a role for, for GGR, um, but we were just trying to focus on the main, the main two that are currently incorporated within, within the modeling world. Okay, uh, I have one, uh, one question about your criteria system. So mm -hmm. if we talk about one particular uh, process, let's say the hydrogen, Mm -hmm. And among all the criteria you mentioned in your presentation, I mean, are there like a, a scoring system? Let's say which criteria is the core criteria for this process and then the rest will be the minor and that we have like a weighting factor or something? Mm. Yes. So um, we did ask each of our um, participants to weight their, their criteria um, so that they came up with their list of criteria and then they weighted which ones they thought were the most important. So we we certainly enabled our experts to do that. We didn't, we didn't weight the, the criteria ourselves. Um, generally, they were kind of all given uh, an equal weighting among the participants, um, but they, they, they were enabled to, to weight which ones they thought were the most important from the list that they'd come up with, yeah. That's a good point. Okay, um, I think that is for us today. And thank you so much for the great talk by uh, Dr. Clary and Katrin. So uh, are there any other questions? Okay, so I think that's for today, uh, Rachel. Hi. Thanks, yeah. thanks Karen. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool, sorry, my internet's unstable, it's telling me. Um, yeah, so thank you, um, everyone. Um,
for today. Thank you, Gang, for um, being a fantastic chair um, and uh, having some very good questions yourself. Um, and thank you, Catherine and Dermot, for your presentations. Um, thank you, everyone who's attended as well um, and provided some really good questions as well. Um, before we go, um, I will just let you know what we've got next. Um, so we do have um, two more sessions left of the current series. Um, and next week we have carbon dioxide pipelines and transmission, and that's with James Watt from WSP. And that will be at the same time as um, this week's, so our regular slot that we have. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll see some of you um, there again. But thanks again, um, everyone today um, for another fantastic um, and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.